was a very nice introduction. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I had one idea about what I was going to read, but maybe I'll read something from the hell of middle school. Um, so this book is, they, as they mentioned, the, the protagonist of this book is Kenya Curtis. And when the book begins, she's in elementary school and she lives with her parents in West Philadelphia. Their names are Sheila and John Brown. And um, the family implodes and Sheila and Kenya um, take, begin living in the suburbs and Kenya starts going to uh, prep school in the suburbs. And so um, I'll read a description of the school and then I'll read it some scenes that take place there. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else I need to let you know? Yeah, so this takes place in the 80s, which is kind of useful. At one end, the Barrett School for Girls looked like a castle with its stone walls, decorative roofs, impossibly high ceilings, and ancient-looking tapestries. At the other, it was low and sleek, like something in one of the architecture magazines Kenya's father had collected during a brief phase. In fact, whatever wasn't old at the school seemed extremely new. The white desks reminded Kenya of spaceships, and many of the rooms had track lighting. The cafeteria was called a dining room. There, you could eat roast chicken for lunch served up by black women, the only black adults in the building besides the cleaning ladies. As I spooned mashed potatoes onto her plate, they beamed Kenya's smile she was too embarrassed to return. She wondered if they traded smiles with the smattering of other black girls who went to Barrett, 12 by her count the first week. She could not imagine Lolly Lewis, the only other black girl in her grade, who lived in Wynwood and had gone to Barrett since kindergarten, joining in this conspiracy of greeting. Each day at Barrett was a new sensory experience for Kenya. Chilly stone hallways, clammy modeling clay, picking impossibly sticky long hairs off her school bag. A school uniform of scratchy bloomers with a navy blue dress called a tunic or a gray skirt called a kilt. Rubbery tasting mouth guard for field hockey. The sound of handbells. What shall we do with a drunken sailor? The distinct sneaker fart funk of the school bus a gym teacher with a British accent. Dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. Cupcakes for Trinity Howell's birthday. Cupcakes for Catherine Stein's birthday. Cupcakes for Sengu Gupta's birthday. Body on fire with cold as Kenya finally, after two weeks of increasingly irritable cajoling from Mrs. Winston, forced herself into the pool in gym class. Once Kenya was underwater, she tried to stay as long as she could. The murky echoes, soft shapes, and slow <coughs> movement suited her. Everyone at Barrett was so nice. The school was so nice, yet she did not want to come back up to the surface. Being black on the main line was no fucking picnic, her father had said. <laughs> Kenya was careful never to say to these new girls that her parents were divorced, but she led them to believe this was the case. Divorce, so shocking to her before, was almost fashionable at Barrett. Cynthia Mulder and Kristen Schoenbaum were children of divorce. Tuff Weeder and Sharon McCall were children of long-term separation. Mothers were starting interior design businesses and dating old men. Fathers were buying sports cars and dating young secretaries. All Kenya said was that her parents were not together and that she didn't talk to her father very much. No, she didn't go live with him and a bitchy stepmother in the summer. No, they didn't go on vacation. The fifth graders who attended the Barrett School for Girls had heard a lot of crazy things about the city. They'd heard that kids their age carried knives to school and that everyone was on welfare. They'd heard that being on the street after dark in the city was a sure way to get mugged. They'd never heard the one about the family where the father was cheating on the mother, the father not husband because they were never married, the one where the father suggested they all live together in a polygamous arrangement. They didn't know the one that ended with the sleepwalking daughter shooting the mother with the father's gun. They didn't know the one that began when the father, trying to keep the daughter out of foster care, said he would take them lame, then disappeared into America with his pregnant girlfriend. Kenya wasn't going to tell them any of those. Okay. All right, so skipping ahead a couple of years. Debbie Warren was an extreme rarity at Barrett, a mid-year transfer. Her family had moved from New York City. 
and the rumor, an unusual one, was that they were very rich. No matter how echoey and marble-floored the mansions Kenya had been to, no Barrett girl yet had admitted to being rich. If it came up, which it rarely did, they said with the same inflection, I'm not rich, as if the word rich were like the word dumb or dirty. Kenya had done the math on her own situation. She knew that her mother's salary was $37,000 and that they were not paying for the house or their old Subaru or for much of the tuition at Barrett. If these girls who hired cotton candy machines for their parties and had Porsche convertibles in their rounded driveways weren't rich, what did that make her and Sheila? Of course, no one would ask Debbie Warren to confirm or deny if she was rich, but she did look the part in a way that Kenya would not have recognized back before Barrett. The more money these kids have, her mother had declared once on their way home from a school picnic, the worse they look. The ones who look like orphans and dickens? There's your Rockefellers. Debbie Warren wore a great kilt like everyone else, but her tree-torn sneakers had been battered almost beyond brand recognizability. It looked as if someone had eaten part of the collar of her dingy white polo shirt, and her short brown hair was streaked with a dirty blonde that actually looked dirty. For about a month leading into winter break, Debbie Warren ate lunch at one of the two center tables in the dining room. Her air of glamour and mystery had earned her a probationary period among the popular girls. Meanwhile, at Kenya's table, Phyllis whispered, I heard she's like the biggest lesbo. The class had recently learned that word, distinct from the all-purpose insult gay, and the accusations had immediately begun. In retrospect, Kenya found it remarkable in the way of ant colonies and elephant funerals that the girls had never accused Tough Weeder and Sharon McCall of being lesbos, even though they'd been holding hands on the swings and sharing a sleeping bag at slumber parties since anyone could recall. Of course, that might have been because no one wanted to anger Tuff, who cursed casually, played rough at lacrosse, and had a mysterious scar over her right eyebrow. At any rate, when Debbie materialized with her David Cassidy haircut and brusque manner, it was as if the use of the word lesbo had called her into existence. I heard she has a boyfriend in New York, said Zainab her eyes going soft at the prospect. That's pretty much the opposite of being a lesbian. But she totally looks like a guy, said Lolly. Maybe that doesn't mean anything, Kenya said. People are not how they seem. Kenya had recently begun making several versions of this statement. It was not clear whether the popular girls tired of Debbie Warren or she tired of them. In any case, after winter break, Kenya encountered Debbie in what was traditionally her seat with the other girls at lunch. Kenya usually sat next to Zainab and across from Lolly and Phyllis at one of the long tables at the edge of the room. Now she had to sit on the fringes of the group, fr fringes of the, group the last in an ungainly row of three. Across from her was Dory Futter. Kenya thought Debbie would quickly move on to another more interesting group of girls, but she came and plopped herself down day after day for a week. The other girls listened to her talk about her life back in New York with rapt attention. Kenya thought she was, as they used to say when she was growing up, on herself. Zainab had an unusually alert expression on her face as she listened to Debbie complain about the Upper East Side, which she hated, she said, as it was full of snobby old ladies and little dogs. Her best friend in the neighborhood was a bum named Artie, to whom she used to give part of her lunch money. Debbie had gone to a school called Dalton, which was, she said, a rich skank pit. We moved just in time. They were about to kick me out just because I didn't fit in with those moronic rich sluts. Kenya tried to catch someone's eye, Zainab's, because, again, wasn't this someone rich pretending that they weren't? But, of course, she had never discussed this issue, frankly, with Zainab, whose family was rumored to own several luxury hotels in Europe, though she always said her father sold rugs. Besides, she knew the look on Zainab's face as she listened to Debbie. It was hunger. <coughs> Did you ever go to, like, Greenwich Village, said Zainab, trying to put a shrug in her voice? <coughs> Kenya thought that if Zainab ever succeeded in getting Debbie into her house, she'd first have to take down all of her New York posters, including the map of Greenwich Village. It's Greenwich, silly, Debbie said. Yeah, I was actually born in the village. We lived there until I was five. It's cool. That's where all the gay boys are. Don't a lot of them have AIDS? asked Phyllis. Lolly hit Phyllis. 
God, Phyllis, shut up. Phyllis's eyes glistened briefly as she caressed her injured shoulder. God, Lolly. <coughs> Debbie pushed her hair back. I guess a few of them do. It's actually really sad. Not all gay people have AIDS, Phyllis, said Zeynep. Can you thought of Teddy Jaffrey? I should say, Teddy Jaffrey is her mother's boyfriend at this point. He's the only villain in the book. <laughs> Can you thought of Teddy Jaffrey and her mother <laughs> watching a news special about the disease? Teddy Jaffrey had declared that it wasn't just prejudice anymore. He could now decline to shake a faggot's hand for health reasons. Don't say faggot in front of my daughter, Teddy, Sheila snapped, standing abruptly from the couch and walking into the kitchen. I was just kidding, Teddy muttered to no one. Finally, he too went into the kitchen, and Kenya held her breath, waiting with excitement for her mother to deliver him a tongue lashing. Instead, there was a long silence followed by giggling. Looking at Debbie, Kenya asked, why didn't you fit in at your school? A lot of reasons, Debbie said. Like what? Kenya asked. I don't know, Kenya, the girl said in a nasty voice. Why don't you fit in at yours? Later, Kenya would think that what happened next was very weird. She had never in her life so much as hit anyone. And of all the cheek-burning, stomach-sinking things people had said to her at Barrett, this was hardly the worst. Yet, barely missing a beat, Kenya got up, went around the end of the long table, and tried to pull Debbie out of her chair by her raggedy collar. What the fuck, Debbie screamed. The startled expression on her face gave Kenya a lightning thrill. Then the girls were hitting each other amid squeals of, oh my God, and they are totally fighting. <laughs> it drifted through Kenya's mind that there had never been a fight at Barrett in the whole time she'd been there. Then Mademoiselle Lambert, the tiny but powerful French teacher who also taught dance, had each of them by the ear. Are you the crazy, she asked. We go to Matron Wells' office now. <coughs> in the waiting room outside of the office, Kenya heard loud breathing that she eventually realized was her own. Am I here, she wondered. What did you mean by that, she said to Debbie. How do you know whether I fit in here or not? You just got here. <coughs> Debbie sighed for a long time. Duh, Kenya, hello, I'm part black. No, you're not, Kenya said. Debbie laughed. Are you the crazy? Why would I lie about that? I've seen your parents. Are they somehow black too? Ever heard of adoption? Kenya twisted her mouth to the side in a way she'd seen her mother do when in doubt. Debbie folded her arms. Fine, don't believe me. I don't give a fuck, she said, hitting fuck just as the matron's door was opening. <laughs> she regarded Debbie and Kenya and cleared her throat. Mrs. Appleton, she said to her smirking secretary, who sat in the outer room, can you get Mrs. Warren's and Mrs. Price's telephone numbers? So, tell me what this is about, the matron said when the girls were seated in the two hard chairs in front of her desk. Kenya's bottom lip trembled at her proximity to the woman, a tall woman who might have been a stern female John F. Kennedy. There was no point in trying to defend herself. She had tried to dump the new rich transfer student out of a chair and beat her up. I started it, said Debbie before Kenya could speak. Yes, asked the matron. Kenya said something kind of mean about my old school, but it wasn't her fault. She just said, well, implied that maybe it wasn't as good as Barrett. Kenya, why would you speak that way? Debbie spoke again hurriedly. Well, it isn't, matron. It, it isn't as good. But Dumpton is a fine school. Excellent, in fact. Kenya, I have not heard you speak yet. Kenya had been stunned into silence. The new girl was lying for her. She looked over at Debbie again. Her nose definitely looked broader and her blonde streaked hair curlier. Kenya wondered if everyone else at Barrett knew she was black. White people were extremely bad about this sort of thing. I'm sorry, Kenya said. I shouldn't have said what I said. You'll find, said the matron, that you build nothing up by tearing others down. <coughs> Kenya felt Debbie trying not to laugh. For a few weeks after that, Debbie and Kenya circled each other. Debbie continued to sit at their table, but she now recognized Kenya's seat and moved down one, taking Dory Futter's seat, displacing her to an empty table by the window. Kenya continued to study the new girl for signs of blackness. Someday she thought she saw them. She realized she finally believed her 
when she found herself wondering at the fact that she, Lolly, and Debbie all belonged to the same anything at all. Race, she thought. Race, 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 until the word became strange. Thank you. Um, so since this was a lecture, the lecture series in addition to a reading, I brought some very brief comments that I've entitled Children of the Revolution That Never Was, Black and Disgruntled in America. Um, so this is really, this is, I'm answering some questions that you'll have and talking a little bit about the genesis of the novel and some things that I was thinking about and some things that I've been thinking about even more as I go around reading to people. So, um, there are three questions I always get asked. One is, did this book happen to you? I mean, there are a lot of ways of asking this question, but basically, did this book happen to you? And the answer is yes, but more importantly, no. So, like Kenya Curtis, I grew up in West Philadelphia. I first attended a local, predominantly black public school where I was one of very few children raised with a reverence for Africa and in opposition to a racist America that my parents believe sought to marginalize, exploit, or destroy people of color. Like Kenya, I was given an African name. I did not attend church or eat pork. Like Kenya, I transferred to a predominantly white girls' school in the elite Philadelphia suburbs, where it became even more bizarre to explain Kwanzaa to my classmates. Like Kenya, I endured various scenarios of alienation, which is to say that I was a young person <laughs> and then a teenager. That's where the similarity between Kenya's life and my own ends. Everything dramatic that happens in Disgruntled is fiction. My parents still live in the same house in West Philadelphia. If my life had been as riven with turmoil as Kenya's, I would have written a memoir. Question two, how long did it take you to write this book? When I talk about this, I feel like one of those vain older people who don't like revealing their age. I'd like to say I wrote it in seven weeks, which is apparently how long it took Zora Neale Hurston to crank out a draft of Their Eyes for Watching God. But my answer was forever. It took forever. Close to eight years, during which much time was spent wringing my hands about how hard it was to move from a, to a novel from stories, and also just living my life. I moved twice for two different jobs. I got married. I had two children. They were both boys, so that took even more time. <laughs> Question three. And this is so once people realize that none of the exciting stuff in the book happened to me. How did you get these ideas? So, the seed for this book was a conversation with a friend who told me the story of Julian Carlton, the real-life butler who burned down Taliesin, killing seven people, including two children. For those of you unfamiliar with this story, <coughs> Julian Carlton was a migrant from Barbados who worked, along, who worked alongside his wife as a domestic servant in the Wisconsin house built by the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright, who had left his wife and five children, shared the house with his companion, Mama Borthwick, and her two children from the marriage she had left. One day in August 1914, Wright was away, Borthwick fired Carlton, perhaps for erratic behavior, and his response was to set the house on fire and take an ax to the people who tried to flee. This story gripped my imagination for a number of reasons. One might be the fact that though I'd known of Frank Lloyd Wright for years, I'd never heard this. This event would be the most noteworthy thing that happened in most people's lives, but in terms of what most of us know about Wright, it was as if it had never happened. In this, I detected a juicy historical repression. And others did as well, since I believe the incident has been retold in two recent novels about Wright and Borthwick. But as for me, I was interested in the operatic and overdetermined drama of the story. Imagine being from Barbados and winding up a butler in the middle of American nowhere in 1914. Imagine burning down a house and the inhabitants in it in response to being fired. The title Disgruntled was the first thing about this book that suggested itself to me. And as I went on two subsequent tours of Taliesin, a house whose architecture demonstrates a complete disregard for the lives of domestic workers more colorfully than most, I kept thinking about it. Neither Kenya Curtis nor her parents or the social activist group that her parents form are disgruntled in the way that Julian Carlton was disgruntled. They are not insanely violent. 
And nor do they experience the worst that the racism of their time, the 1980s, has to offer, let alone what Carlton and his wife would have encountered in 1914. Kenya is relatively privileged. She does not suffer from poverty, <coughs> violence, neither at the hands of police or civilians, or addiction. Yet, for me, the word disgruntled captures something crucial about what it meant to be, means to be, black in America in the aftermath of the civil rights and black power movements of the mid 20th century. In the 1980s, Kenya Curtis and her parents are coming out of an era in which a political mobilization in black communities from Alabama to Oakland resulted in new laws, new anti-racist practices in business, government, and education sectors, and new possibilities for social and economic advancement. Yet, in the era during which this novel is set, the vision of economic equality, social equality, racial acceptance is disappearing faster than you can say, Ronald Reagan. I created this story by marrying the fictional possibilities of my own experience and perspective to the inspiration of poor, crazy, murderous Julian Carlton, and by drawing on other sources, including film and music. I also drew heavily on literature, which, if named, will answer another question, which is, what are your favorite books? A Partial List, Song of Solomon by, Solomon by Toni Morrison, the children's novels, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Harriet the Spy, Gwendolyn Brooks's Maud Martha, George Eliot's 19th century British masterpiece, Middlemarch, Two Girls Fat and Thin by Mary Gatesgill, Ta-Nehisi Coates' memoir, The Beautiful Struggle, a bunch of things I'll never remember. I wrote this novel from the pre particular perspective of an African American who was raised, despite being skeptical, skeptical of this country, to hold it to its off-sighted, off-broken promises of liberty and equality. From what I hear, though, the story of Kenya as a story of difference resonates beyond her specific subject position as an awkward black girl. I've gotten feedback from readers, strangers all over the US who say, I was just like Kenya. Some of them are black and grew up in politically radical households, but others were white and grew up Christian or Indian American or Mexican American and moved through various settings, described to me in email in some detail, feeling that they did not fit in. But also the title, the sense of being disgruntled or fundamentally peeved with the broken promises of our nation despite what I believe to be a good faith effort on the part of our current president, goes beyond Kenya and beyond being the only insert identity here at the school dance. In this time of increasing econo economic inequality, regular mass shootings, an epidemic among middle-aged working class white Americans of drug addiction and suicide, the notion of being disgruntled recalls for me the ending of another one of my literary models. Who knows goes the famous ending of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man another source, and a veritable encyclopedia of American alienation, but then on the lower frequencies, I speak for you. Thank you. So, questions? And I had a very good discussion with the, the, the literary festival class today, but they should feel free to still ask more questions as well. <laughs> or you could get brownies. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's interesting. I think, I mean, I think they change in some ways and other ways not, but I mean, certainly like, and West Philadelphia, West Philadelphia is, is interesting, you know, in and of itself in a, in a number of different ways. Um, but I think that one of the main differences <coughs> in the city now, I think in a lot of American cities is that I think gentrification is a, like a, a really major force in a lot of American cities, right? So I think that that, that can sort of change your reality in a, in a number of different ways. Um, and so, and I think, you know, the, it's interesting
interesting to, to ask that question like right now as opposed to maybe 10 years ago. Because I do think that like there was a moment where people, uh, I feel like a lot of, you know, generally in terms of thinking about what it meant to be black in Philadelphia, people had sort of forgotten about those, the, the, like that movement, like sort of the radical social changes of like the 60s and 70s. And now are sort of moving back towards thinking about social movements and social change in a, in a way. Um, and so, because that's one of the things I would have said, well, it's further from that moment, but it's closer to maybe a new moment of social mobilization. But um, there's probably a lot of other things that I couldn't tell you are different or not. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, like a student like that, her experience at a school like that, would have a lot of similarities to, you know, what's in this. Just And that's just based on, like, reading at various places and talking to various people about that. Um, but, yeah, it's a good question. Yes? Uh, based on some of the comments you made in class earlier today, talking about fiction and identity, um, I know that identity politics, you know, is, that's something where you can, you know, discuss that in terms of theory and theorizing and stuff. But I was wondering, um, you know, like I said, based on what we talked about earlier, um, if you could expand on why you think fiction is a particularly rich medium to explore identity or talk about identity. So, I mean, so one of the things I said in the class was that I felt like fiction are all sorts of creative expression, but fiction particularly, and maybe poetry thinking about as well, is like a really good way to think about identity just because it, its identity is a fiction, right, that we're heavily invested in, and so there's there's living, there's performing their, that identity and constructing that identity. And so thinking about fiction as a way to like think about what that means, I think is, is, is probably as useful as something else, you know, <laughs> sociology. Um, but I think that, um, but I also think that sometimes people bracket out these questions as if they're antithetical to whatever's going on in fiction. Um, and that somehow, like writers who are, you know writers who are writing about people of color, or writing about people who are, you know, queer or whatever, are doing something really specific when they write about themselves in their writing, like that. That's a specific content when actually it's the same as anybody who's writing about humans has to write about identity. So I think that is. I also like to sort of push back on the way that we think about, you know, bringing those things, you're not bringing it in, you know, it's just there. And if you want to write about people, you should really be writing about specific people, you know? So, you had a, did you have your hand up? Oh, I did, yeah. yeah. Um, given that you were sort of um, looking to your personal history for material and reflection, um, I'm just curious how the act of writing, and I guess creative writing, um, has changed your relationship with the past. So that's a good question, particularly for people who are writing and are getting older, because one of the things I definitely started to do is forget what happened. Um, which is, that's when it's good to have a sibling and be like, no, you didn't do that, I did that, or so, you know, whatever. Um, but it definitely, like, it starts, you know, there is, even if, like I said, a lot of this stuff is, you know, is definitely strongly fictionalized, but the details. Like the way, the things you do, the things you play around with to create the world you want to write about, some of that stuff begins to blur. Um, and then it's also like, these things become also complicated because, you know, I've written uh, short stories and I wrote this novel and they're basically about childhood and adolescence. But like, it gets more complicated when you start writing things that are happening closer to when <laughs> you're writing about them. Cause like, I'm not really that accountable to a lot, you know, a lot of the stuff that goes on here, like those people, I'm not gonna run into people who I was portraying generally, you know, here. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are ethical questions that come into it if you're, you know, writing about your life, which I think most writers are, even writers who are writing things that are unrecognizable as their real life, they're, they're working out something about their life. Yeah, right. And uh, we were talking about why in the moment when he um, he attempts to molest Kenya and, and leaves, well, it's one or two, but why he left and how 
how you understand his relationship to her. I can tell she's an artist when she was talking about that. Because it's such a um, scary moment. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think the way I thought about why he left was, I think, like, for him to be able to um, establish, like, sort of for him to be able to assault her in that way successfully, meaning that she wouldn't go to her mother, she would have had to present herself differently. And so when she says, like, what are you, basically, like, what are you doing here? Instead of some other response, it's, like, not the right response. Um, and so, I mean, that's kind of how I think about it. Like, that was, like, a moment where, like, he texted, sorry for the spoiler alert. I mean, I, and also, I, like, at the beginning of, like, reading from this book for things, I would, like, really guard plot secrets now. I'm just like, and then in this tell-all scene where everything happens. Um, so, yeah, so I think, like, I think that's part of what I was thinking about with that. Um, but actually, like, I, I was just, like, I heard a story like that, and it, it stuck with me for a long time because it was so... What, what did happen, and how can you tell on someone when this thing didn't happen? And I just think, you know, I, I, it, was, it was like kind of interesting to me to think about that as, um, and just like the threat of something being almost as horrifying as the actual thing. So, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that I, so when I was talking about this in the class earlier today, I was saying that, like, I hadn't thought very consciously about the voice much, but I do think that it, in something like that, it, it can naturally expand because it's expanding to talk about different things. And so as it's talking about these different things, I think, and bringing these different references, I think that's, like, that's a, Feels, it feels natural to shift the voice in a lot of different ways. So I guess that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. Um, what was your thought process and what were some of the challenges in switching from writing short stories to writing full-length novels? Yeah, so that was the part where it was horrible. It was a nightmare. <laughs> um, but the main challenge was that um, I really didn't feel like I had a grasp on plot and how to plot something. And I mean, I felt like I had a grasp on how to plot something that was 10 pages, but how to plot something that was going to go over 100 pages without it feeling really contrived and artificial. And what I did was, you know, I just, I just kind of settled in to write something that was pretty episodic. And then sort of, you know, I was joking in the class that like I threw a gun in it because that's like a, that's an automatic plot. <laughs> I mean, is that the plot of most, like, movies and TV? I'm like, just, there's a gun. That's the whole plot. So, that was handy. Can't do that for another novel, so that's sad. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just struggled with it and wrote something that I think if you read it, you'd be like, yeah, this seems like somebody who wrote a lot of stories wrote this, you know? Yeah, I'm not going to be offering any, like, master classes on plot anytime soon. <laughs> So I have not. Uh, yeah. So, sort of happily, I really am not expected to <laughs> produce scholarship at this point. You know, I'm even though you know I'm sort of hired. You know, I have a PhD, and so I teach literature classes and that kind of thing. And so I think and I read a lot of it, but I haven't written any of it. And I, you know, only recently have I started to like think, like get a little bit of an itch to do that again, um, sort of around some. Hamilton, but <laughs> I was going to say something lofty, but really, I just like want to write an article about Hamilton really badly. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I think that, but one of the things I told the students today is that I really think now, I think of scholarship and literary criticism as like stories about stories, and what I'm most drawn to when I'm reading 
theory now, this stuff that sort of bears the mark of somebody who's like really interested in it, who's really doing a creative project and doesn't think of doesn't think of this as like, you know, some objective almost scientific. I mean, I was also saying today I think science is a story about a story, but you know, sometimes I think people can approach this as if like this is a very a, a dry and objective endeavor when really it's another artistic it's an art, right? Trying to make meaning out of something with your own words. So that's how I think about that's how I think about what I'm attracted to in terms of scholarly work and theory. Yes. No, I mean, so, yeah, and I mean, I don't, I have taught some of the books that I really like, but, um, that, I, that I mentioned here, but sometimes I don't want the students to, like, put their paws on it. <laughs> like, oh, I don't want to see that pawed over. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, so in fiction, I almost always teach, um, Sherman Alexie's stories, um, Edwidge Janicat stories, um, some stories by Miranda July, Flannery O'Connor, um, Edward P. Jones, uh, Cheever sometimes. I mean, that list goes on and on. And then I teach um, a number of things in, in lit so I teach mainly creative writing in African American lit classes. I have a Caribbean lit class um, where I teach a book called The Lonely Londoners. That's like one of my all time favorites. Um, I teach Claudia Rankine's work. Um, I teach a book by June Jordan that's like one of my all time favorites. It's a, her memoir. Um, oh, yeah, but speaking of putting pause on something, I am, this week I am teaching, next week, and I have a class called New Black Arts Movement Black Expressive Culture After Nationalism, and I'm teaching To Pimp a Butterfly. Now, I realize that is not like my own personal property, but I am a little nervous about oh, the students put their paws on it. Right. So, could you talk a little bit about how um, you transition from an adult male to right. an adolescent female for the for the first volume? So that um, I didn't. So I knew I was interested in that, but I knew that I wasn't going to write historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sort of then kind of pivoted and embarked on this other story, and I didn't really know where that was going to come into it. And then I, I wor there's a way it comes into the novel. Um, and it's, um, but it, it's kind of, it was almost like a parallel process. Like, because I, I just knew that, you know, so it wasn't like he turned into something or it's a, you know, it's like a different thing. So that story is kind of in the novel, like intact, but in a different way, in a specific way. Yes. So this is like a big fat cliche, like my husband. Um, he, he was a fiction writer. I met him at the Iowa Writers Workshop. And he, um, you know, we've been sharing various drafts of various sorts for years. And I think, like, at this point, I think that's it. And then, you know, I've, I've had editors and that kind of thing. But I think he, I'm like, I don't, no, things don't really leave the house unless uh, he reads them or on his part unless I read them. So. Yeah. How often do you find yourself restraining yourself um, when you create a character, say that I have to rework uh, what she's done if it's a woman because she's doing it in the tradition? That's not something that she would do. That's something I would. I would do. Yeah. I mean, I think that this happens, but it certainly is. Um. But it's certainly easier to reconcile in a book like this because it's about because it's about a young person and so there's less of a chance of me doing, you know what I mean, like writing the character. But I also think that this novel is one of those novels that's largely, even though it's about a character and the character certainly shapes the plot, 
a lot of what she does is watch other people. And so it's, there's something neutral about, it's not, there's nothing neutral about the voice, but there's something neutral about the character in that way that makes it more straightforward. I never did, and I think though that, and also, I like your question. It's a polite way of saying what other people have told me, which is that when they read it on Kindle, they were pressing the next page button because <laughs> they found the ending abrupt. And um, I think like no, I never thought about it. And then I was at a reading group, and um, these women started speculating about it, and I was like, oh, that sounds right. Like one of them said. I Obviously, she just like goes to temple and it's fine. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, like I think that I, I wanted it to be kind of um, like, and then it just ended without being tied up in any way. But anything you could propose would be reasonable, I think. <laughs> Because I don't think that I mean no my person I mean what's weird about it is that I don't feel I don't ever necessarily really feel like I'm on the main line because I'm at Haverford so you know like I don't think the students think of they, they're not thinking much about what's around them and so since I live in West Philadelphia I like, drive out there it's but it's a totally different set of you know mores <laughs> and you know complicated social interactions that I'm get navigating just by virtue of like working at a working at a college, you know? Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it, it is weird, it's weird. I mean, it used to be really weird when I first <laughs> moved back and started working here and sort of going to places that were like, oh, I thought this place was so great or I thought, you know, this was where this happened or whatever. Um, but it's not as like haunting as maybe I would have thought it would be. All right, well, thank you. So I'm happy to sign this.